This is the Bible College of Wales Lecture Channel. Jesus, the healer, is our course today. And this is David P. Griffiths, your lecturer, welcoming you to one of the most wonderful blessings which God has given to his people. The blessing of healing, healing and freedom in the name of Jesus. But this is no formula, let me tell you. We look at Isaiah chapter 53. The declaration is this, who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now when it comes to the healing ministry, which can be very controversial, this verse is key to understanding this ministry. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed for healing comes about through hearing faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God but that word being spoken to you implicitly as a given time in a given situation I remember myself being at Wellington General Hospital after I had been thrown down a ladder onto a radiator my head completely split open I knew to wait upon the Lord I knew he would come and as I waited for an operation or procedure to take place to stitch me back up he came to me. The prayer of agreement. Some of you may think it's just a matter of getting two or three of you to agree on anything and it shall be done. It doesn't work. Unless the instigator is the Savior himself. In all things, he must have the preeminence. For our course is called Jesus the Healer. Him alone, the blessing giver. And as we hear from him and obey what he says, and in Warrington General Hospital, he said, say these words after me. The words of Isaiah 53. He hath borne our griefs carried our sorrows with his stripes we are healed now as we come to this introduction to our Jesus the healer course which is in 14 parts as well as this beginning I want to say a few things to you first I want you to know that Jesus already has bore our sins, our sorrows, our griefs, our sicknesses, and disease. And that he comes with his word to free us, to deliver us. And we are going to be covering some really interesting subjects taken from this wonderful book by F.F. F. Bosworth called Christ the Healer. F.F. F. Bosworth being on the... Canadian evangelist and it is he we are going to talk about today in relation to the healing ministry and in future times we shall have understanding in relation to those who need healing number one our second course or rather the second part of this course healing in the atonement we then ask the question, is healing for all? The Lord's compassion. Fifth part, how to appropriate the redemptive and covenant blessing of the bodily healing. Then, appropriating faith. How to receive healing from Christ. 
How to have your prayers answered. Faith that takes. Then part 10, the rhema confession. And then the fullness of God's life, the secret of victory. Then part 12, God's garden. Part 13, why some fail to receive healing from Christ. And finally, Paul's psalm. Now as we come to our notes this morning, this afternoon, good evening, whenever you are watching this recording, which is also being live streamed at this time at ecctv.org. Let us go to page one of our notes, which you should have downloaded. And we read this. Please note the Bible College of Wales continuing relates strongly to the biblical truths of Christ the healer. Please, however, do not assume that this ministry supports all doctrines of all ministries which are mentioned in the summary of Bosworth's life. Now, why do I say this? It is not our place in this course to get involved in the controversies of some ministries associated with the healing ministry. It is one of the most attacked ministries on earth. And I do not want students, I do not want you to be distracted in any way. In the 1950s, there was the voice of healing movement in America. And there was great controversies associated with it. And I want you to understand primarily that we will be emphasizing biblical truth in relation to the healing ministry. But at the same time, it would be remiss of me not to cover on occasions the traps one can be led into in relation to the healing ministry. It is a very serious ministry indeed. There are people's lives at stake here. And we all need to keep on track with the Lord. But I guarantee to you all that as you move out in the healing ministry, attack after attack will follow, not only of the mind, <coughs> excuse me, but also from those who would look to take you along a course of doctrine where you need not go. Which is why primarily in this course of Jesus the healer, it will be emphasized time and time after time again what the word says. It is not just about praying for the sick. Jesus prayed for nobody to be healed. Not one. What occurred in his ministry was that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. That he himself took our sicknesses and disease to the cross. So as we study the life of F.F. Bosworth, I simply have taken the notes online from Wikipedia. And I'm going to have a look at this life. First of all, F.F. Bosworth, as we turn to page two, was born on January the 17th, 1877. Those of you who have downloaded the notes, you will see his picture there. He was a pastor, evangelist, and author. And... He specialized in healing. He was an early religious broadcaster. 1920s, in the Depression era, he became a great Pentecostal faith healer who led a bridge to the mid-20th century healing revival. That's called the Voice of Healing movements of the 1950s. 
Born at a farm near Utica, Nebraska, was raised in a Methodist home. His Methodist experiences also included salvation at the age of 16 or 17 and spontaneous healing for major lung problems a couple of years later. Boswell's life after that was one that followed Christian principles. Though his church affiliation changed several times over the years, and several years after his healing, he attended Alexander Dowie's church in Zion City, Illinois. Then came into Pentecost and attended Pentecostal services. Most of his later ministry was associated with the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church. Now when Bosworth came into the Pentecostal experience in the year 1906, he had an intense desire to preach the gospel. Leaving his business pursuits and stepping out in faith for his subsistence. Approximately 1909, he moved to Texas. 1910, he started a church in Dallas, loosely affiliated with the Alliance Church. He was one of the founders of the Assemblies of God in 1914. He was with them until 1918, when he had a disagreement on the initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit and withdrew. Then started another church in Dallas, affiliating with the Alliance Church again. And his revival meetings in the 1920s were sponsored by the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church. During the 1920s, he was known for his big tent revival and large auditorium meetings in his advocacy of faith healing, with people from all denominations attending. He was with the Alliance Church until around 1934, then affiliated with them again in 1944, and starting around 1930, he began one of the early successful gospel radio ministries. Today, he is best known for the book, Christ the Healer. It went through seven editions in his lifetime, and has now has over 500,000 copies in print. In my view, this book, outside of the Bible, is the finest ever written on the subject of healing. F.F. Bosworth was one of five children, grew up living on the prairies in Nebraska in a devout Methodist home, appears to have had a normal childhood. His father was a Civil War veteran, part of an Illinois company, who would have moved to Utica, Nebraska sometime after the Civil War was over. But before F.F. F. Bosworth was born. Now when F.F. F. Bosworth was about eight or nine years old, he accompanied his father to a soldier's reunion when he saw a cornet being played. Bosworth had been given a baby pig by his uncle. He raised it, traded a couple of animals, was eventually able to trade for a cornice of his own. From that point, he worked on becoming a self-taught musician. One source says he began playing in the juvenile village band, then played in the senior village band. When Bosworth was around 10 or 11 years old, his parents moved from Utica to University Place, Nebraska, which was an educational place for Methodists in the region. Bosworth became a member of the local band, eventually being good enough to be a member with a leading part in the Nebraska State Band and to play for the local literary societies. At the start of the summer of 1893, at the age of 16, he left home. And in late 1893 or early 1894, while at a visit in Omaha, he attended a revival meeting with female friend. She convinced him to become born again. He later described the experience as joyful. 
and the book Fred Francis Bosworth, his life story. Bosworth initially developed lung problems when he was about 10 or 11 years old, shortly after his parents had moved to University Place, Nebraska. This occurred when he got overheated in a hot room, helping with a friend's operation, then went to the cold outside and got a chill. The lung problems continued for the next eight years, getting significantly worse when he was a young man, age 18 or 19, when the doctors diagnosed tuberculosis, said that he would soon die. Bosworth then went from Nebraska to his parents' new home in Fitzgerald, Georgia, for the last visit and arrived in a near-death state. While there, he attended a religious meeting, was approached by an older Methodist Bible woman who used to walk the hills of Georgia and the Carolinas selling Bibles and preaching the gospel. An account written by Bosworth's son in the later printing of Christ the Healer says, she prayed for him, got up, and was instantly healed. And another account published many years earlier adds further details to this healing. It says that Miss Perry told him how lovingly ready God was to make him well. And laying her hands on him, she prayed that he might be healed. And that same hour, Fred began to mend until uh, many days his lung trouble was already a thing of the past. Around 1895, after Bosworth had left home, his parents had moved from Nebraska to Fitzgerald, Georgia, where a Union soldier's colony had been started. In late 1895 or early 1896, Bosworth's health was rapidly growing worse, and the lung problems which began shortly after his family moved to University Place, eight years before, were getting worse. Doctors said he did not have long to live. So he took what he though would be his final trip to see his parents. His mother nurtured his health back to a point where he could get around, and he later claimed to have been miraculously healed at that religious meeting in Fitzgerald. According to Joybringer Bosworth, after his healing, Bosworth became an active member of the community in Fitzgerald, buying then on operating a barber shop for some time, working assistant postmaster for over a year. Then he was elected as city clerk, a position he held for two years. And in Fitzgerald, he married at the age of 23. His wife was the daughter of the, another Civil War veteran. Right after he was married, he ran aloof of local politics by supporting someone else who was running on a prohibition platform, resulting in his not being re-elected as city clerk at an election held shortly after his marriage. After this, he became a bookkeeper, then a teller at the new bank in the city, then worked for a mercantile company owned by the bank. In Fitzgerald, Bosworth had begun and directed a band and gained the respect of the band members to the extent they tried to apply Bosworth's values to their lives. In a year or so after they were married, after seeing copies of Dowie's newsletter, Bosworth and his wife moved to Zion, Illinois, then called Zion City, a newly formed town which was started as a place where religious values would be applied to the community as well as the home. Prior to moving to Zion City, he'd given up operating his band because of some of the situations created conflicted with his beliefs. When he went to Zion City, he began to play his cornet again, this time in John Alexander Dowie's church, where he was soon made the band director. It appears that he first met 
John G. Lake at Zion City. It's possible that Bosworth was the minister Lake had ministered with in Indiana before after Lake left Zion. Before he went to South Africa, the timing of both of them ministering in Indiana coincided. Through the influence of Dowie's writing and preaching, which they had read and begun to follow before their moves, Parham's presentation of Pentecostalism, which included divine healing, their own private study of the scriptures and their own personal experiences involving divine healing. The two began to learn about and practice divine healing. It was at Zion that both Bosworth and Lake first came to a Pentecostal experience. It's from Zion that they both began their eventual ministries. While one recent theologian, in providing a background of Bosworth, commented that Bosworth and Parham were soon acting as competitors for the hearts and minds of the city. This does not appear to be supported by any of the contemporary accounts. No dispute or contention is mentioned in Parham's biography, in any biographical material on Bosworth, or in the book which summarizes the events in Zion. To the contrary, it appears that Bosworth fully cooperated with Parham, and that it was the liver who ran the city after Dowie's demise, who competed for the minds of the people. Available documents show that Bosworth was one of half a dozen people whose homes became meeting places for the early Pentecostal believers. Bosworth was referred to as their bandmaster, not as a preacher. Bosworth was not viewed as a threat by Bolivia, shown by the lack of character slurs in the local paper. Bosworth was at the time growing in his ministry, beginning with personal witnessing then doing evangelistic work with another experienced minister before stepping out into his own independent ministry. And after bracing Pentecostalism, Bosworth went through a number of trials that helped form his character. Started by leaving his business ventures, stepped out in faith with no financial backing, creating times when needs were supplied at the last moment. We know about those. Immediately began by getting a job selling pens, using this as an opportunity to testify. By early 1907, he was on the field working with another minister. His first article telling of meetings he was holding was published in the latter Rain Evangel in 1908. In 1911, he responded to a call to preach at a bush arbor in Texas and was badly beaten up by a couple of groups who felt he had crossed racial barriers. Started a church in Dallas, and the trials continued. Even though he was preaching divine healing, his young son died, and later in 1919, his wife also died apparently as a result of overwork, then influenza, and finally pneumonia. And after his wife's death, Bosworth went into full-time evangelism, and several years later, he married again. In 1906, while still in Zion, Bosworth embraced Pentecostalism. In meetings with Pentecostal pioneer, Charles Parham. Pentecostal message met resistance from the administration in Zion City, making it so community facilities were not available to him for holding ministries or other meetings. As a result, for weeks they met nightly in the living room of Bosworth's home, as well as in several other homes, with Parham going between the homes prior to a large tent being erected for services. And from the time Bosworth received his Pentecostal experience, Bosworth felt driven to share the new life he experienced. 
One early account says he immediately took a job selling pens so he would have an opportunity to testify to others. But in April 1907, he was into the ministry full-time, joining Cyrus Fockler in the meetings he began to hold in Milwaukee. His ministry continued, and the December 1908 issue of Latter Rain Evangel records meetings he was holding with Fockler in Indiana. And there he held meetings in Fitzgerald, Georgia, and Conway. Then several cities in Texas, Dallas, was the final city in the Texas tour. And the meetings there were in the later part of 1909. Following Bosworth's Dallas meetings, he started his first church in Dallas in 1910. Church began as independent Pentecostal work with a loose affiliation with the Christian and Missionary Alliance organization. In 1914, Bosworth was involved in the starting of the Assemblies of God. One of their first directors in the process, he brought his church into the organization. In 1916, the Assemblies of God formalized their doctrine that the initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Ghost was speaking in tongues. Bosworth did not agree with this and tried to get them to change, presenting his arguments at one of their conventions. When it became clear in 1918 that they would not change their position, Bosworth quietly withdrew from the Assemblies of God, started a separate Christian and Missionary Alliance church in Dallas. So around this time, that is 1918, the Bosworth published his pamphlet, Do All Speak With Tongues. Even when pastoring his church in Dallas, Bosworth would hold meetings in other areas, and his ministry always had an element of praying for the sick and divine healing. When his wife passed away in 1919, he arranged for someone to look after his children. Then went starting larger scale evangelistic meetings. Peer the turning point for Bosworth's healing ministry. These meetings which occurred in Lima, Ohio in August 1920. Pastor there asked for Bosworth to preach on divine healing. And while Bosworth had previously been in divine healing, or rather believed in divine healing, had prayed for the sick, he had not previously preached divine healing. Bosworth writes that he went to the Lord and asked, Suppose I preach on healing and the people come and don't get healed. The Lord said, if people didn't get saved, you wouldn't stop preaching the gospel. Bosworth studied the question, prayed about it, saw it was God's will to heal as well as save people. In the Lima meetings, Bosworth stepped out on the word, preaching divine healing, stated that healing of the body was much a part of the gospel as salvation of the soul. He invited the sick to come and hear the word of healing for their bodies. The people responded, and they were healed. Led to more who came for salvation, and the rest is history. In 1924, Bosworth published the first edition of Christ the Healer. The book contains many of his sermons on the topic of faith healing, and his responses, his critics' edition, included five sermons. Prior to Bosworth's death, the seventh edition had been expanded to include 14 sermons. He was also the author of dozens of other tracts, printed sermons and articles, some of which were later condensed, including in subsequent editions of Christ the Healer. One example is the Christian Confession, chapter title Confession. Probably his most controversial pamphlet, was do all speak with tongues, an open letter to ministers and saints of the Pentecostal movement. 
F. F. Bosworth held a number of evangelistic healing meetings across the United States and Canada in the 1920s, with 39 extended meeting locations in the six and a half years mentioned in Joybringer Bosworth. Now, Bosworth had contact with many of the Pentecostal and holiness ministers of his generation and was both influenced by them and influenced them. Prior to coming to his Pentecostal experience, Bosworth spent several years under the ministry of John Alexander Dowie where he would have heard many of Dowie's ideas on divine healing. From Zion City, he knew John G. Lake, Charles Parham, and a number of other Pentecostal pioneers. Approximately 1907, Bosworth, Lake, and one other Zion preacher visited the Azusa Street Revival and made contacts there. One photo shows them with Pastor Seymour, the revivalist at that time. He was associated with many of the early Pentecostal ministers. Had Marie Woodworth Etter hold several months of services for him in 1912 and knew the early leaders of the Assemblies of God. Bosworth also knew many of the ministers associated with the Christian and, min and missionary Alliance Church, including A.B. Simpson, famous, of course, for the chorus, Yesterday, Today, Forever, Jesus is the Same. He also knew Paul and Luke Rada. While in the Chicago area, Bosworth also met E.W. Kenyon. It's unclear whether his meeting with Kenyon was before his move to Texas, since he had returned to the Chicago area by 1924. How close a relationship the two men had and the degree Kenyon may have influenced Bosworth's early thinking is unclear. But Bosworth's 1930s booklet, The Christian Confession, which was later condensed into the chapter of the 1948 edition of Christ the Healer, <clears throat> mentions many of the thoughts in that booklet and chapter came from Kenyon's writings and were used with permission. One researcher who looked at Bosworth's other works to determine if any were influenced by Kenyon could find no other link in the 1924 edition of Christ the Healer does not contain the chapter that is in the 1948 edition. And let's just deal with this just a few moments. There is a doctrine which we are not going to get into in this course, which relates to this paragraph. It's called JDS, Jesus Died Spiritually, embraced by E.W. Kenyon in his book, From the Cross to the Throne. We'll cover this later in other courses, but at this time, I pray you are not distracted by this, because it could get you into controversies where you do not need to go. It is my knowledge that F. F. Bosworth in Christ the Healer is not exactly embracing JDS, which is Jesus died spiritually, at all. Simply that he took our sins, our sorrows, our griefs, our sicknesses and disease to the cross. And the mechanics of that, which E.W. Kenyon started to explore is not an area we need to go in this course. This course is simply about Jesus taking our sicknesses and disease to the cross, which is the whole heart of this wonderful book, Christ the Healer. When the Great Depression hit in 1929, money for large-scale meetings became scarce. According to Bosworth's magazine, Exploits of Faith, <clears throat> it appears he still had large campaigns away from home through 1931, but after his campaigns were closer to home. Bosworth was friends with Paul Rada, 
one of the first radio evangelists. Paul Rado was broadcasting on Chicago radio stations prior to 1929. First ad in Bosworth magazine for a Bosworth radio program was in January 1930, indicating that his radio evangelism started in either late 1929 or early 1930. He began with a program called the Sunshine Hour. Bosworth eventually established the National Radio Revival Missionary Crusaders as a non-profit corporation in Illinois. By the early to mid-1930s, he was broadcasting regularly over radio stations in the Chicago area, including WJJD. Bosworth's increased radio ministry in Chicago appears to coincide with Paul Rada's reduced broadcast frequency. And due to financial problems, Paul Rada's last evangelistic broadcast in Chicago were in 1933. Bosworth continued to broadcast well into the 1940s. There's a general gap in the information available on F.F. Bosworth and his radio ministry from the early 1930s to the mid-1940s, with the one available magazine of his from 1942 indicating that he was broadcasting from several stations across the country, and a 1963 article providing a general overview of Bosworth's radio ministry. During the 1930s and 1940s, it appears he also conducted many healing campaigns all over North America as finances permitted. F.F. F. Bosworth, as of 1950, commented he had more than 30 years of great evangelistic campaigns. 14 years at this time, conducted the National Radio Revival, during which time received about a quarter of a million letters. As mentioned by his son R.V. Bosworth, in the final chapter of the ninth edition of Christ the Healer, Bosworth found it difficult to travel during World War II due to gas rationing, but also found it difficult not to preach. Shortly after, shortly after World War II, he thought his ministry might be over, and he retired to Florida. And during the gap in information from 1934 to 1944, Bosworth accepted at least some elements of British Israel theology, indeed as George Jeffries did in Great Britain, and left the Alliance Church not to return until 1944, when he was welcomed back into the Alliance and was asked to preach at one of their conventions, and along the way publicly apologized for having been in error. While some who follow British Israelism claim that F.F. F. Bosworth maintained a British Israel view of prophecy into his death. Did you not ever offer any proof, any evidence to support this other than one radio sermon by Bosworth, which does not go to the extremes many do with that doctrine? In late 1951, at the age of 74, Bosworth went with William Branham to Africa to continue their work. Now, this is why I issue the warning on page one of our notes. There is a lot of controversy about the ministry of William Branham moving into the oneness movement later. Now, there is no evidence in my view there's any influence of that in Christ the healer. And so that is why I'm very happy to embrace it. And there's no real evidence to show that there was evidence of the oneness movement in Branham's early ministry, which I think included the halo of fire, which is depicted so commonly. The book William Branham, A Prophet Visits South Africa, records their time there, as does a book titled William Branham Sermons. Both of these books include a sermon of Bosworth's, 
And a number of William Branham's sermons refer to his time and experiences with Bosworth. And after the campaign with Branham, Bosworth returned to Africa several times between 1952 and 1955, also holding campaigns in Cuba in 1954, Japan 1955 and possibly 1957, and accompanying Branham on a campaign to Switzerland and Germany in 1955. Through at least 1956, it appears that when Bosworth was not overseas, he worked with Branham on a number of campaigns. 1957, when Bosworth's family thought it was his time to go, Branham visited his bedside, prayed with him, greatly encouraged by his testimony, and Bosworth recovered his strength, and it was not until several months later, in 1958, when he eventually died again with an outstanding testimony. According to his son's description in the ninth edition of Christ the Healer, the family was gathered around Bosworth's bedside talking, laughing, and singing about three weeks after Bosworth was in bed full time. Bosworth then looked up, never saw the family member's presence, began to greet and hung, hug people. He was enraptured. He did this for several hours. Then with a smile on his face, he laid back and went to sleep. When Bosworth died, Branham was asked by the family to come to preach his funeral, but wasn't able to attend because he was in the middle of a campaign. His son in 1973, wrote this, when the dust of skepticism kicked up by the mercenary methods of a decade of faith healers had finally settled. There was a deep hunger in the hearts of many sincere Christians for a sane and scriptural presentation of an irrefutable Bible truth. I believe we have this in this book, Christ the Healer. We note here that the Reformation is not completed. For God is continuing to build his original church, not the counterfeit, on the principles shown in the Acts of the Apostles. For there is a clear distinction with what we read in the Acts of the Apostles, and what we witness in the establishment today. And R.V. Bosworth continued, not only did Dad illuminate Scripture, but he confirmed his word through Dad's personal ministry, healing those beyond the help of medical science and producing in their lives a depth and holiness of living that could not be attributed to Satan or to man. I'm sure my father did not realize that the truth received was 50 years ahead of its time. And only after it's been proven through his life and ministry could it be used as a major contribution in God's reformation process of returning supernatural power to the church. Now in this edition I have before me, which is the ninth printing of April 2008, I have two forwards. I have the forward to the uh, 2000 edition by Bob Bosworth. I also have the forward to the 1973 edition by R.V. Bosworth. And I also have here the forward, the original forward from 1924 from F.F. Bosworth himself. And he wrote this. And it's a wonderful preface to the book. 
And with this we close. When in the year 1924, we wrote the messages for the first edition of this book, little did we dream that the truths presented were to bless such vast numbers in so many parts of the world. The results down through the years have been a demonstration of the truth of the inspired declaration that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. This preface by F.F. F. Bosworth, I beg your pardon, refers back to 1924. During the 44 years that have followed, six more large editions have been printed and read by thousands of ministers and laymen who have written to us telling how they have been enlightened and blessed, soul and body, through reading and rereading these messages. And in this book, we have tried to use a vocabulary common people understand. Continual stream of testimonies comes to us from those soundly converted and miraculously healed through their own faith, which came to them while reading and meditating on the truths of the Bible, which we have tried to make plain. We have proved thousands of times and are continuing to prove that by the simple presentation of enough of the written word of God to the minds and hearts of the incurably afflicted, they can be brought to the same state of certainty an assurance concerning the healing of their body as to the healing of their soul. We are therefore increasingly thrilled over the privilege of planting the incorruptible seed. Remember, the word is the seed. The word of God in the hearts of those for whom Jesus died. What a glorious fact that we have been bought with a price. To be the Lord's garden in which his imperishable seed, the word, is to be continually planted, watered and cultivated, so it can produce presence and eternal wonders. In the seed there are possibilities beyond the power of the human mind. To conceive just as, as in a little seed, there is potential tree a million times bigger than the seed. All of God's wonderful works are potentially in the seed. And by keeping God's garden planted as the farmer does his fields, a child of God can accomplish things a thousand times greater than men of the highest human talents can accomplish by receiving his promises. We found that those who tuned in the broadcasts of the National Radio Revival most of whom we have never seen by reading the healing and other literature we have published, get a much broader understanding than those who hear only occasional message in our public meetings. Because they can be reread and studied, our messages in printed form produce better results in the souls and bodies of those for whom we pray than in some who attend our meetings and desire to be prayed for before they hear enough of the word of God to produce faith. This book is sent out with the earnest prayer that many thousands more may learn to appropriate the many blessings promised in the Bible. We desire that every one of you be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. And in this introduction to our course, Jesus the Healer, we ask just one question. Please, I'm looking for around 500 words. It's just one question. Bosworth's son in 1973 saw how the word was to be presented as to be given the primary attention. Why is this so important 
when it comes to the healing ministry. I'll give you a clue. He sent his word and he healed them. Attend to my words. They are life unto them that find them. If you hearken unto the voice of Lord your God, none of these diseases. Have you received our message today of this wonderful book by F.F. F. Bosworth, which is the textbook for our course, Jesus the Healer, presented from North Wales to you all around the world as students of the Bible College Wales. Lindsay, my wife, is going to come up and sing the beautiful song. He touched me, and oh, what a joy that floods my soul. Come on, Lindsay. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. Thank you, David. This is what it's all about. The touch from Jesus, our healer. Something happened, I know. 